Uh, John Geiger is the founder and CEO of Tracer Media. This is a Columbus company. They do uh, a lot of digital media. They do a lot of educational games, and uh, they've also done some entertainment games. There's a really cool game out there called uh, Cornhole. It was for iOS. Uh, it's down right now, but hopefully it'll be out one day again. Uh, they've actually been in business since 1997, which is a good accomplishment. Uh, he's a good guy, and he's all kinds of special. Uh, please welcome John Geiger. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, before we start this, where did uh, Henry go? Would you be my life coach? Please? Like, I was really nervous about this speech today, and then um, you came on, and now I feel like I can just get things done and move on. It was very motivational and informative. So, I, this is the best title I can come up with sitting at the bar at 11 o'clock uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but it is pretty meaningful, uh, and we'll get to the meaning of it uh, in a handful of slides. So, serious edutainmentification is how you pronounce it. Um, so, we'll walk through a few slides here. Uh, so, me, similar to some of the other speakers here, grew up during a time where there were some pretty uh, fantastic things happening with the world of video games. Uh, I grew up a uh, complete burnout during the 1970s and 80s, hanging out inside of the degenerate lounges uh, called arcades. And this was really the public's first real introduction to video games. I mean, we had Pong, we had a few other things around. There was pinball before that, and, and pinball as far as gambling and, and, and everything else. But the arcades w was really one of the, the amazing places where we saw uh, some pretty radical things happen over a short period of time. Games designed by one, two, and three people. Uh, new games on a regular basis, all with really uh, huge variety in gameplay themes, uh, styles, and, and designs. And it was also a, a place where you could find people like this. And it was really uh, a fanatical environment. Uh, so fanatical that you could uh, predict future trends, like the trucker hat that that kid's wearing back there, <laughs> and all the sloppy haircuts. But then you could also walk into a, a public place wearing a winter coat with no shirt on. That was completely fair game, so uh, it was a great, and you can meet guys like this. And not only guys like this, but what is happening over there on the left? Like, I own a Defender machine, but I don't have people in leather corsets and long curly hair making out next to it. Uh, those days are gone. Um, and then you also had uh, where video games, this is one of the first times where they really reached uh, the, the status of cultural phenomena. They were on every news channel, uh, in every magazine. Uh, we had the, the time cover with all of the great uh, King of Kongs folks, the, the Chasing Ghost people, uh, with our high score attempts. And uh, it, it touched just about every walk of life. And, I've sat here for the past like six or seven hours watching the other lectures, trying to come up with the punchline to my joke of a businessman, a cowboy, and a flasher walk into an arcade. <laughs> but I haven't quite figured out the rest of it. So maybe next year at this event, I'll, uh, I'll have gotten there. Uh, but while this is also going on, uh, hanging out, being a juvenile delinquent in these public spaces, this happened to me as well. And uh, for those of you old enough, or those of you who understand emulation, this blue color has been burned into your uh, retinas for, for the rest of your life. The Commodore 64 was one of those things that, that gave me uh, a great amount of ability to um, experiment and play and learn uh, computer programming uh, in a very unintimidating way. I did not go to school for mathematics or engineering or anything else, but at 12 years old, I could pick up a copy of Compute Magazine or Byte, and I could type in for hours on end a bunch of uh, either assembly code or basic code and end up with uh, a game at the end of it. And by typing that stuff in myself, observing the games, uh, and then trying to interpret that code, I uh, was able to make games myself. And that was a very liberating experience. Uh, and in combination with that, this happened. And I've over the years, uh, I've been doing what I do for close to 20 years, and I've looked back a number of times, and this may be the single most important thing that, that, that I came across. Uh, Gary Kitchen's Game Maker was a cartridge originally for the Commodore 64, 
and it was a full game studio. So if you think of Unity, this was the 8-bit, you know, maybe even 4-bit version of Unity. It had an audio studio, it had an animation studio, a sprite studio, and then a composing studio, which was basically your um, scripting area. And the great thing about it was Gary Kitchen, who went on to found Activision, um, incorporated all of the Activision assets. So you were able to drag and drop all these scenes from Pitfall and other games and put them together and compose these really cool things. And uh, it was the first time, it, it, and I've identified this you know, recently looking backwards, that game design and game development became the game for me. So as opposed to playing the games, I enjoyed more making the games. And uh, the first game I ever made uh, was called Scurvy Dogs. And basically, there was a bunch of dogs running through the pitfall world uh, chasing you. And I didn't know how to do collision detection or anything else, so you just had to keep running. Like, that was the only point to the game. And it went on for hours. And uh, there was no score, no end. You just had to keep running from the dogs. And so, uh, years later, actually two years ago, I got to meet Gary Kitchen, and I got to explain Scurvy Dogs. Uh, unfortunately, he did not try to option it for his uh, current company as his latest title. But Game Maker was one of those things that, that really uh, changed the way I thought about uh, what it is that I wanted to do. However, there was a huge problem. Uh, game Maker allowed you to make games. Basic programming allowed you to make games. Game Maker did not ship with anything uh, of the concept of a runtime, so I could not distribute my games. So similar to the lecture that we had earlier, earlier from uh, Jeremy about being confronted with something that you have a passion for and you're developing these skills for and, and it's all you want to do, the huge problem was the industry was just not ready. There was games being developed. I think Game Maker, even Gary told me that it's maybe two or three people put it together. Uh, they got the EEPROM burn, they shipped it as a cart. That was something that I couldn't do. I could not even distribute my games um, you know, via floppy disk at the time, uh, or cassette, like if you really want to get into it. Um, so it was a really uh, difficult spot because um, there were no resources available. There were no college programs. There was no counselors that were explaining to you this is a viable career for you, or not even viable financially, but this is something that would be really exciting for you to do. Um, not even parents or peers or anybody else. Game developers were myths to us. They were few and far between, and they were uh, not necessarily seen as something that you could grow up to be unless you were extremely, extremely special. And as much as Steve said that I was special, I'm not that special. So. Um, so I ended up here on the stage in a very roundabout manner uh, in that I formed a company called Tracer Media. And so we've been here in town for uh, the past 16 or 17 years. And um, after bouncing around a little bit, uh, I went to college at OSU for the film program. Uh, film was something that was a little more attainable, but still had that creative part to it and a technical part to it. Um, and thank whatever gods are there. They canceled the film program the day I got to college. <laughs> so uh, that really saved me from standing for the next 18 hours holding a lamp over top of some uh, film production and getting paid you know, union wages. Um, so I, I managed to kind of put together my own curriculum. Uh, this was back in the early 90s where I um, I got a degree in communication, so I understood a little bit about broadcast and policy and everything else. I got a job in the art department's computer lab, so I had the keys to the art department's computers and all the manuals. And I would stay in there all night long reading the manuals uh, and had access to uh, Macs, Amigas, everything else to do uh, graphics and uh, programming and, and uh, whatever else I wanted to. And then I had a lot of friends that were in the computer science department. And so I'd go over there on my free nights and hang out and learn a little bit about hardware and, and uh, uh, other you know, parts of technology. So I kind of forged my own uh, degree and 
thankfully, again, at the same time, uh, this thing called the World Wide Web really was just getting started. So the Mosaic browser, which became Netscape, we had been using the internet since, you know, back on that blue screen with the Commodore 64. Um, but the web was very, very different. And that allowed me to uh, kind of apply all the things that I had learned in that little trifecta of my college career, uh, along with some of the things that I've been doing uh, when I was younger, uh, and launch a career out of it. And so I, I formed Tracer Media, uh, as Steve said, back in 1997. Um, and I formed it around a few principles. I had a little bit of experience working for other agencies um, before. Uh, I had a great job at OSU, and I left to go work for uh, uh, one of the first interactive or web startups here in town. And one of the things that just absolutely killed me was that I was, uh, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but you quickly learn in a commercial environment that you have to hold your tongue and be quiet about your own ideas. And sharing information uh, is, is, can become a very, very uh, bad thing. And it was very stifling because here I was used to a very idealistic view of coming in to work, uh, thinking about designs, thinking about development tactics, thinking about products we can make or whatever else and sharing those ideas freely. Meanwhile, the guy sitting next to me, I would catch him in the boss's office every morning telling them these great ideas that he had uh, and, and how he should get a raise for them. And it, it just, it crushed me, it crushed my spirit. So I ejected. And, uh, and went full time with my company uh, around uh, the idea that I wanted to build an entity that was really focused on the culture and really focused on the community. We have a great team of people. We have nurtured these people. They have nurtured me over the years. Uh, people leave, they come back. Um, we've just had a great experience. Uh, most of the employees that we have right now have been there for 10 years. Uh, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years each. They make a very personal commitment to our company. Um, and, and it's a free thinking, uh, free flowing idea environment. Um, and, and that is one of the things that I value the most about what I've been able to accomplish and what everybody else has enabled me to accomplish. Um, and, and then the community. We've been able to participate in meetups and, and groups like this. And uh, there's really something special that's going on here, especially in Columbus. And uh, uh, to, to be sustainable and to, to be a business around that is really rewarding. Uh, we've also been very slow uh, about our growth. Calculated, I put that in there a few days ago, and then I've looked at it a number of times. Um, you're tossed around at the whim of the economy and the whim of your clients. So there still is uh, you know, some part that's calculated, some part that's luck. Um, we are a services-based company, so we do jobs for hire. Uh, we do not do products. We do not do our own games. We do not self-publish. Um, but we've been able to uh, build these relationships with clients uh, that are very long-term. I mean, the first client that I uh, incorporated the business to work with is still our major client today. And we have an amazing relationship with them. And they let us do some, some very creative uh, and technically challenging projects. Um, and so that leads into the last point is we fell into educational software. Uh, I did not set out to, to, be, uh, to spend you know, 15 or so years in the educational software industry. It just sort of happened. And I'm very happy that it did because if you had asked me you know, years ago, especially when I was uh, in college, whether or not I thought that that would be an exciting and challenging environment, um, I probably would have said no. But after getting into it and seeing uh, some of the boundaries and seeing the challenges and, and the environment and the users and the content especially, um, there are some significant and very engaging um, challenges, whether it's from a design standpoint or a development standpoint um, uh, or, or just, just delivery uh, as well and the politics involved. And so it's, it's been incredibly engaging to be within that, um, that environment. And the one thing going back to the, uh, the, the problem slide is that 
Throughout all of this, um, I never gave up on the idea that I was passionate for games. Um, we did have to do a lot of work, I and mean, we've done some websites, you know, that um, are, are, are not all that fantastic or special. But we've also been able to take a lot of principles, game mechanics, game design concepts, uh, pop culture, everything else, and weave them into our primary uh, audience, which is educational software, and build a successful business around it. And so uh, the games have never left either the culture of the company or the pro work product that we, uh, that we create. So this leads me to some observations about being in business in Ohio. Um, we've been under the radar. We've been, uh, we don't really market or advertise. We just really focus on our work. And I had a fantastic experience. Um, for about four years, I was living the majority of my time in San Francisco. So we landed a gig working for a rapidly growing startup during that second wave of, uh, of startups out in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And uh, they put me up out there. I would come back every once in a while to keep the business going. But I got immersed in the talent, the business, uh, the culture of what it's like on the other side of the country. And that was an invaluable experience. And for as many things um, as I had out there that were really amazing, for as much temptation as there was to uh, just pick up anchor here and uh, stay out there, I chose to come back. And there were a number of reasons why, um, and this gets to some observations I had from the outside in as far as being a business in Ohio. And we'll get back to the game stuff in a second, but uh, this is somewhat relevant to especially this conference here. Um, there's good and there's bad. There's a perception problem out there. Uh, nobody really could even place Ohio on the map as far as the folks that were out in San Francisco. Uh, this is a very fast moving industry out there. There's a lot of people there that are just there because they're part of the talent pool um, and they're inventing things like Twitter and Facebook and everything else uh, all up and down the coast there. Uh, but when they look back on Ohio and Columbus, uh, when I would tell them where I was from, they knew absolutely nothing about it and they had no idea uh, what types of people came from here as far as business, talent, games, software, anything else. Um, and there's a very big difference in the business model out there. We have some, and this is changing actually uh, over the past five or so years. Um, uh, we had a couple panels earlier about startup and about funding and VC and Kickstarter and everything like that. And that wave is kind of coming through Columbus. But traditionally we are a service-based town. We provide services for a fee and uh, that's how business works. Anywhere from the Mississippi over, that's it's kind of been the, the model. And Columbus, uh, you know, surrounded by Rust Belt cities and everything else, has kind of fallen into that. So we're kind of changing that over uh, time and becoming more aware of how those businesses work and how those teams work in those companies. But I was really fortunate to uh, learn and understand that uh, we have an amazing talent pool here in Ohio. Um, our team, we had five guys dedicated to this company out there that grew from 20 people to 400 people over a couple of years. We were their engineering team. We built their entire platform. They could not find anybody that could do what we do. And we provided that service for them. And we could have added 10 more people to the team if the timing was right. And, uh, and that was just for engineering. That does not factor in design, architecture, uh, UI, UX, all these other uh, fantastic talents that, that we have here in town. And then we have amazing resources um, in town here, whether it's uh, Columbus College for Art and Design. When I would mention uh, Advanced Computing Center for Art and Design out there, no one had a clue as to what it was. And here is a place where, the, one of the birthplaces of computer graphics, you know, if we go back in the history of it, very important in, in, in everything that we do, whether it's animation, graphics, game development, uh, in, in, in internet applications. Um, but then we also have amazing resources like um, Tech Columbus, um, meetup.com, we've got X number of meetups in here, and that's how I met a good few of you, including Steve and uh, uh, Wes and, and Jim a while back. So there's community that's built around that. 
Um, Third Frontier Foundation, somebody mentioned it earlier, Ohio has a ton of money. A lot of people, especially the uh, game developers group, is trying to figure out how to loosen that up so that we can get it. But the Third Frontier Foundation is one of the biggest venture capital firms in the country uh, as far as the number of dollars that they can invest, and they invest it here in Ohio. Uh, and then community. I mean, we, we have, uh, you know, extended our arm to others and they've extended it to us. And I, I do not feel um, a really stressed uh, position of um, competition here. It's collaboration, uh, whether it's another firm, uh, whether it's other developers, other designers, everything else. They welcome us in and we welcome them in and, and we really be able to build something here, especially in Columbus. And then the quality of life. I mean, my mortgage payment for uh, a decent sized house with a yard uh, was one fourth of that of my apartment, one bedroom apartment in San Francisco. Um, obviously there's some you know, cultural things uh, you, you do in the oceans right there, Marin's right there, um, Yosemite's right there. You've got all these great things there, but I, I really put a lot of value into the quality of life that I had uh, back here in Ohio and uh, wouldn't trade it. So we're ready for industry, uh, basically, and that's what the OGD and, and the Ohio Game uh, Developers Group has been trying to do all these years. So one of the things that I forgot to mention when I was talking about our company is that I've spent the majority of my time working in uh, K through about eight elementary education, developing software um, for uh, major publishers and some small publishers. And so I've had the opportunity to take that, uh, that industry or that scene and look at it through the lens of games. So bringing that passion of games and then looking at what it is that, um, that our clients were trying to accomplish. And I've got some really positive and really negative uh, things that, uh, as far as these observations with games. So educational gaming uh, is something that a lot of you may not have considered um, as far as game development career paths. So we have games out there that the goal is to educate or transfer knowledge or train somebody um, and we use games as the vehicle to do that. Uh, these games um, can work on cognitive, social, motor abilities, analytical thinking, problem solving. There's a whole range of skills uh, and, and information that we can transfer through the mechanism of games. And they're games that range through an entire industry here. So uh, primarily where my experience is, is within K through 12 or K through 8 education. But we see them and have done them for corporate training, uh, for healthcare, for social change. There's Games for Change, which is a big organization that tries to use games to uh, bring public awareness to different issues, whether it's uh, slave trafficking or drug use or anything else that's happening in the world. And uh, Games for Health, which is something that has just ballooned over the past maybe five to ten years because uh, there's a lot of investment there where they're using game mechanics and game theory in order to communicate things about whether it's uh, on a consumer level, personal health with things like the Wii Fit, or uh, on an education level for doctors, uh, hospital uh, patients, and everything else. So that sets up the stage for this uh, next handful of slides, which hopefully uh, some of you will recognize and find some interest in, but uh, let me preface this. that This is my own kind of personal history uh, as far as games that I have found to be uh, educational or entertaining and interesting uh, within my personal history, but then also within my work. And um, some of them are, you have to look at a little bit obtuse. They weren't necessarily set out to be games for education, but I found extreme educational value in them. And then some of them uh, set out to be educational games and, and failed miserably. So this uh, giant wad of text, a handful of you may remember, again, if you were uh, alive at the time or you are into emulations or whatever else, but this is Zork. Zork was a, a text adventure game that was created um, Infocom, is that the, the company that did it? And Zork, um, this is what you got. This is how you started the game. There was very little uh, amount of instruction, um, but you got in there and you explored and you uh, creatively used your text input 
to figure out what commands and controls you could use in order to, to achieve your goals and, and get to your outcome. Uh, this kind of kicked off something uh, that ties back into the title of the presentation. That's infotainment, I think, came out right about this time. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, like indirect, indirect uh, educational outcomes to this as far as uh, whether it's even just typing or spelling or language usage, verbs, nouns, everything else. But then also uh, creative exploration was huge. Uh, and, and so this game, to me, had extreme uh, educational value. I played it all day long. Um, it took me forever to get to the end after I got eaten by the Gru a number of times. And, uh, but it was not produced necessarily by an educational publisher. This, however, is uh, something that was put out there back in the late 70s uh, for the Atari uh, 2600 console. And uh, this was what we began to see as what would be called edutainment, which was the combination of education and entertainment. And so this was a big field that everybody thought would be fantastic. But if you look at this, um, this cover art here, and this was indicative, this isn't, I'm not just picking on Math P. this is indicative of all Atari covers. But I really thought that I would be a young Eddie Van Halen racing Formula One race cars until I became uh, Goodwill Hunting over there and mastered mathematics. And so that's, that's what I got out of this, uh, this box art. But then I got to this after I put it in there. And that leads me to this. <laughs> so, but, and I don't know what has happened in the past 25 years, but some, a lot of these Atari games did look like the cover when you played them, but I, we were just kids and our imagination was, was running wild. But this is not educational. It's not entertaining. If you put this in the lineup next to Space Invaders, Combat, Yars Revenge, everything else, uh, how often are you going to pick this up and play it? Because it's just not even fun. The learning in here is very rote. So, Sure, we can add up zero plus two, and we could try to enter it in with a joystick, which is incredibly frustrating. Not only figuring out what are all those things on the track. Like, I have no idea what is going on there. Uh, and it's slow, and it's painful. So it just ends up being incredibly frustrating. Um, but when you analyze it from an educational standpoint, there's no scaffolding, there's no trajectory, there's no how do I learn how to do math rather than how do I learn how to solve this puzzle. So this was a, an attempt by the industry to, um, to maybe try and make parents feel good about buying an Atari or about parents wanting to punish their kids uh, because they did something bad. They take away all the good games and then give them this and say, uh, go for it. So here we, we bring in the PhDs and so we get a little bit better. Math Blaster uh, started out in a pretty rudimentary form here. I think Commodore 64s, Atari 800s, everything else. Um, and had a much more sound educational uh, um, foundation behind it. And uh, we were able to, oh, is that really just a minute and 35? Oh, dear. Um, OK, we got to get to the good ones. So anyway, Math Blaster, it's, it's in our pop culture. It's, uh, it, it ended up being one of the longer running series of games. Um, oh. Who knows what dysentery is, right? And how did you learn how, what dysentery was? Did you learn it in class? No, you learned it from Oregon Trail. So this guy uh, built this on his free time. And he was a teacher and built it. And there was a line around the corner after school for kids to play this. So this is a, a, a classic game, one of the most iconic as far as the crossover between games and, and entertainment. And uh, Mule, another great resource management game uh, that came out for... Uh, early platforms. Carmen San Diego, again, not developed by educational publishers, but a fantastic way to learn history, geography, everything else. Um, and SimCity, there's a nuclear meltdown in Boston, um, but you got to learn how the terminology and everything else around civic and regional planning, plus geography and everything else. <laughs> Professor Pac-Man, I don't know why he's winking, and I don't know what's going on with the ghost over there. Um, and if he's a professor, why is he wearing a graduation cap? But Professor Pac-Man got no action uh, in the arcades, uh, not even from the feathered hair girl, burnout girl uh, in the 80s, because she's just using it as an armrest there. <laughs> this is my favorite one. This is why I wanted to go quickly, because 
Jesus, I'm not saying. Uh, Bible adventures. So serious games. That's a topic uh, that's really popular right now. But Bible adventures couldn't be more serious. Uh, it could also be called the rapture uh, preparedness planning uh, simulation. Um, but the one thing about Bible adventures, I always thought of it, they ripped off other gameplay. It's really watered down. This is for kids that weren't allowed to play other games. Um, maybe you learned a little bit about history and Bible stories or whatever else. But the funny thing that I found out recently was that it was made by these two guys. There's a shirtless Jeff Spicoli and some dude in a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. <laughs> so now I wonder whether or not if I played Bible Adventures backwards if I would hear satanic messages. <laughs> Donkey Kong math. I mean, this is pathetic. They slapped Donkey Kong on top of a drill and practice exercise and, uh, and considered educational. Uh, this one gets the most abuse online of anything. And I think this was actually built in Columbus by the company that I used to work for before starting Tracer. So apparently dinosaurs became extinct because of asthma, because they didn't have the puffer that this company made. Um, and this, this game and this company takes so much crap online uh, about being the worst educational games ever uh, for Super Nintendo. This is just weird. Typing of the dead. Take a game engine and let's just change the guns to typing and it'll be great. Uh, but somehow it's so weird that I think it was actually successful. <laughs> and then we get into some of my favorites. This is WarioWare and this again goes back to Gary Kitchen's Game Maker. So this is games, uh, game development and design as gameplay. And this allowed you to create any one of these tiny little games and it guided you through this process. Uh, they had the sound and they had the, the gameplay and everything else and releasing it to the store. I believe you could even release it to your friends to make these little tiny micro games and, uh, and, and really challenge kids to, to think creatively. And Scribblenauts, one of my favorites, not only because you could uh, have very challenging wordplay, very creative problem solving, very analytical situations, but also you could have Cthulhu fight Jesus or Abraham Lincoln if you knew what to type in. So uh, eight-year-old kids learning about Cthulhu, can't go wrong there. Uh, and then this is the Unreal Tournament engine. So this is them using it for healthcare games in a very non-traditional way. So that engine is very powerful. And I think one of our buddies at uh, ACAD actually used it for architectural rendering, so you could do walkthroughs of buildings uh, and also a lot of other complex projects. But here we have a medical simulator that uses the Unreal Tournament engine, so same technology, same uh, amount of effort and work. And then, of course, Minecraft. This is the last one we have in the examples. Minecraft is just the unexpected, wildest uh, success. As uh, one of the guys in the earlier session said, I mean, 40 plus million in revenue. But what educators have figured out is how to use this for geography, social studies, science, uh, education. Not only that, but just being able to compose your own environments and everything else. That type of creative play, uh, the, the virtual version of Legos, uh, is incredible for, for especially K through 12. So um, this, this is a case of doing it right. So when we look through those slides, the one thing that made me that I ended up thinking about was there's educational games typically produced by educational publishers uh, out there in the wild um, and then there's games that educate. Zork is a game that educates. Minecraft is a game that educates. Typically developed by game developers and ending up having this serious amazing byproduct that it's not only engaging and in, in consuming but there's so many excellent uh, secondary uh, positive outcomes as far as education whether it's just tactile interaction knowledge uh, research analytical thinking and uh, so that leads me into what we're talking about with educational games and it's a really, uh, you know, we, we've built our own games that have been uh, sad and pathetic as well, and some that I think are, are very good. But we end up back to these same models for educational games that the entertainment game industry does not ever deal with. Uh, drill and skill, that Donkey Kong one, or uh, Math Blaster, or Math Grand Prix, just driving them through a sequence of, uh, uh, of tasks. Uh, games as rewards. Do your chores, and you get to play this game that's sort of like an entertainment game that you may like, but it's not quite as good, and you're probably not even going to like it. And then games interspersed with content. So we have milestones within the content lets you uh, play small little games uh, every so often. And then content disguised as games. So that Donkey Kong one, put a Donkey Kong on it. Kids will love it. They'll forget that it's homework. That's not the case. Kids are way smarter than you. 
And then uh, incentive and reward systems. This has been a big issue over the past handful of years with the, the not, not gamification, because I love uh, Jay McGonigal and everything else that's going on with gamification, but the secondary industries have picked it up and basically think that if you put badges and you put a point system and a high score and a leaderboard on something, that all of a sudden your, your retention is going to go up for education material. And it's, I, I don't believe it to be uh, entirely true. And we're also in a continued state of reinvention with, with educational games. So as an industry, we have created our own terminology and then ran from it because we ended up doing it wrong. So edutainment. Uh, that was a great word early on, and then people ended up putting out really lousy product. Oh, did I get overtime? Is that another eight minutes? Oh, great, we're going to slow down. Um, so, so edutainment. This got turned, uh, termed chocolate-covered broccoli because they were dressing things up as entertainment, uh, and it was still educational materials, as opposed to looking at the real opportunity for seamlessly integrating gameplay with education and making the gameplay educational and the education gameplay. Um, and then people got so burned out, and, uh, and that term got such a bad rap that they had to purge it and come up with serious games. And there are some great things that have come out of serious games. There's a guy named Ben Sawyer that uh, puts on, has put a lot of effort into serious games, especially around healthcare. And there are some really fantastic things, uh, like the surgery game that I showed you, that have come out of that. But again, it got bastardized and put into the educational context, and now people are running away from that. And the next one up is gamification. And uh, like I said before, Jay McGonigal and, and uh, a few others, just Shell and uh, even Ben Sawyer, have done some really cool things with gamification by applying game mechanics and uh, various elements of gaming to other mediums like education, training, uh, work, whatever else, and getting very positive results. But then we have companies like Badgeville, where it allows you to put badges on everything. So if you look at their case studies, uh, you can go to their site and it says, I increased productivity by 110% because instead of just collating all these documents and stapling them, every time I do that, I get a star. Who cares? Like, you get a star. Like, it's not going to translate into a pay raise. It's not going to translate into a better stapler or anything else. And so it's this false uh, uh, concept that's being applied across education, uh, and people see it as the next holy grail of gaming in, in alternative uh, to entertainment environments, but it's going to fall flat on its face and it's going to end up with a, it becoming a bad word again, um, with the exception of, I, I would say, Jane. Uh, she's probably the only one that can save it. So in educational games, really often mimic entertainment games. We have watered down versions of what we see out there. Uh, Bible Adventures was a Legend of Zelda, but you're running around picking up scrolls and running through Galilee and doing all kinds of other adventures. Um, uh, in some of the other games we looked at, um, they take whatever is out there as far as a, a game mechanic or a conventional uh, entertainment game, and they'll, they'll borrow pieces from it and, and, uh, and try to pass it off as just good enough. And, then, and we just cannot compete with entertainment games. The entertainment games that are out there are, have millions and millions and billions of dollars put behind them, really intelligent people uh, there, and uh, we typically try to, in the education world, um, put one thing besides the other, and when you have Math Grand Prix next to, um, uh, you know, Yars Revenge, or I, I'd probably pay, play E.T. for the 2600 before I played Math Grand Prix. And so, uh, we just cannot compete there. And we see a lot of uh, this, and this is what I ended up thinking about as I got through all of those games and thinking about my past history, is that um, we see educators as game designers. And that's, that's a very steep climb for them. Uh, educators have a phenomenal ability to understand uh, the learning processes and the different uh, methodologies that are out there and the content and curriculum and the requirements that go with it. Um, but game design is, is something very, very uh, unique and complicated to them. But I've seen a lot of game designers that really can act as educators and can bring that to the field and can educate the masses um, using the skills that they have. So that creates opportunities for everybody here. And the point of this uh, session really was to point out that 
Um, I know a lot of us are passionate about games and a lot of us come to this uh, looking through the lens of entertainment games or the games that we play on a regular basis. But there is a significant number of career paths out there for you to apply those skills and I beg of you to apply them because I do not want to live the next 20 years with Math Grand Prix all over the place. <laughs> So we finally have a recognized value of games. People, uh, because of consumer technology and because of the proliferation of games, we have uh, educators, um, administrators, boards of education, everybody uh, throughout all of uh, our population here can look at games and truly recognize them with the exception of one or two Columbine Sandy Hook incidents that happen that scare people uh, for, for, for unknown reasons. We really do see games as being an acceptable and, and uh, valuable part of what it is. And we're starting to see a lot of validation of the outcomes of the games. We've also seen changes in technology, so we're adopting um, tablets uh, in, in classrooms. Um, computers are, are lot, uh, have a lot more penetration in the classroom than they did in the past. And then also in development technology, as Jeremy talked about, uh, there's a lot more ways for us to develop games. And then the success of casual and social games is huge because those models of gameplay uh, significantly uh, can be leveraged and, and impactful in the education field. And then the in industry is growing. There's a lot of career opportunities for you. Um, there's still massive uncharted territory. Um, the design and creative challenges that are there for you are the same as in the entertainment industry, and you can have a very positive impact with it. So the most important slides that I have here is that it all came first full circle for me. So uh, what is born of the arcade must return to the arcade, and it's a very dark picture, but I've built an arcade over the past handful of years. And here's the, the back room, but one of the games there is Berserk. And I looked up the guy who made Berserk, and uh, Alan McNeil. So I spent my entire career scraping enough money together so that I could buy this game Berserk in my adulthood because I played it as a kid. So I look him up. Turns out that he wrote Berserk and then used that money to go on to build uh, Macromedia Director, which was the first tool that I used to enter into my career. So it's a very strange, cyclical uh, relationship there. Uh, and then for anybody who wants to stay up late tonight, you're all welcome to come back to the arcade. Uh, we're right around the corner across the uh, river. We've got about 50 games or so. Uh, so questions. You can ask about anything. Thank you. We only have like a minute or two because I yeah, rambled. Yeah, a couple minutes for any last questions. Um, there you go. Um, when or if do you feel uh, edutainment games uh, could possibly become mainstream? I really think when, when people stop thinking about them as two separate things and trying to jam them together uh, into one, then, then we'll really have it. Uh, over my career, and I know a few others I've talked to, we really try to implement game mechanics and game concepts as a, a, a first-class citizen within the content and the educational goals of what we're trying to do. It's very hard to do, um, but it, it, it could take a while, and that's why we need really talented people who are first-generation game designers who have a passion for education versus educators that might have an interest and a passion in education or, or game design. So hopefully, hopefully soon, hopefully we don't go through another one of these terminology changes, uh, you know, five, ten years from now. Thank you, guys. Oh, thanks.